Anne-Marie, tell me uh, your article um, in The Atlantic um, dealing with this work-life balance, uh, women potential, had an extraordinary reaction. Um, a lot of pushback, a lot of enthusiastic support as well. Tell me about the reaction and what you made of it. Well, I'm happy to, but let me just say, I did not for a minute say that women can't have it all. I said women can't have it all unless we make some major changes in the way work is structured uh, and in, our, in our, uh, the yeah. way we think about the arc of a career. But there have really been three major categories yeah. of reactions. And, and the one I get most frequently uh, is just gratitude. Uh, yeah. Gratitude for being honest, and opening the conversation. So this is something that has been on many, many people's minds. That's not news to me. It's the kind of thing that, that women talk about when the door is shut. Uh, and now I think we are talking about more uh, broadly, particularly younger women who are looking at my generation and saying, I'm not sure I wanna make those trade-offs. I wanna have a different balance between work and family, but I wanna have a full career. I wanna make it to the top. But how am I going to do this? So it's opened up that conversation. The second category is, 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 is criticism, of which there's been a fair amount. I, I'm always worried when people come up and say, I really liked your article, <laughs> which uh, I, I, you know, a lot is left unsaid. It's clear they've had many discussions where people did not. But so there's personal criticism, and, and that is fairly easy to dismiss. I tend not to read it. Uh, and a lot of it is, is, I think, misunderstanding what I was trying to say. But there's, there are two critiques that are worth addressing. And one is more from my generation that essentially says, you have given them a reason not to hire women. And them it means the white men who run the world. And this was... I think true, certainly for the generation before me, and in many ways probably true for my generation going into law firms in the 1980s and early 1990s. You would not have been well advised to say, I am leaving to pick my kids up from school, I have a doctor's appointment, I have a play that I want to attend. You, you essentially said, you can do everything men can do and you're not going to, and, and the way men do it. Um, you know. A lot of things have changed. We have an African-American president. Uh, my son recently was watching John Kerry at the Democratic National Convention, and when I said, he said, who's that? And I said, well, if President Obama's reelected, uh, he, he may be Secretary of State. And my son, who's 13, said, without missing a beat, you mean a guy can be Secretary of State? <laughs> so I think we're at a stage where we can afford to have this conversation, and I frankly don't see how anybody can be competitive without hiring women. Uh, and so I just don't think that that's an issue. But the second critique is that I'm discouraging younger women, that this is a profoundly discouraging message and that it's tough enough, the job market is tough enough, and I should be upbeat and saying, look, you can do it. And I think you can do it, but I don't think women should think it's their fault when they have to make compromises. I think we all have to support a different set of choices. The last category is for men, and the first, a lot, a lot of fathers who frankly write me and say, well, you know, I didn't pay much attention to this while I was making my career and my wife was taking care of my kids, but now I watch my daughter and, and my grandchildren and I don't like what I see. And then a lot of guys who say, you think women still don't have it all, try being a man yep. who wants to take advantage of paternity leave, of flex time, who says, no, I can't go out for drinks after work because I need to go home and take care of my kids. That the gender stereotyping about you know, a guy who's serious and committed to his work is just as bad as the gender stereotyping around women. And I don't have any academic basis for this yet. I, I have many people who've written to me and many people who've written uh, on the blogosphere, but I think that's a major issue going forward, that we have to change the, the, the view of men as well as Yeah, women. I'm very struck by Clay Christensen's last book on how to manage your life, and one of the things he says is that most people from his generation at Harvard and as Rhodes Scholars at Oxford who were male, actually had lived rather unfulfilled lives. They had broken marriages, they had no relationship or little relationship with their children. They'd made huge sacrifices in their lives about their families, which they regretted, but they'd never talked about it. Yes. They'd, 
they hadn't actually had it all. They'd, they'd, they'd looked superficially successful, but they'd failed as private people. I wonder if the, the, the male sacrifice has been greater than people expect. Than I, think that's, I, I think that's right. I mean, I, you often find very successful men saying, I wish I had spent more time yeah. with their kids. I mean, the, the, one of the things that motivated my choice was I have no idea what the future will hold in terms of foreign policy jobs, but I can be absolutely certain that my children will only be 15 to 18 or 13 mm. to 18 once. That once this time is gone, it will not come again, I can't get it back, and that it's a foundation for the rest of their lives, and I hope for the rest of mine. I want them you know, to come back and want to sit around the table. So I think, I do think it, there's this, been this division of public and private responsibility where men in leadership positions have thought, you know, the right thing to do is to not pay attention to whatever I might want to do privately. But the reverse has been true where women have not felt free to say, you know, I'm going to sacrifice this for my career. And we're in a, we're in a position where we have to bring those two spheres better together. I'm in the process at the moment of writing a long piece about Scandinavia, and I've discovered that all of the female politicians, all of the politicians that I meet, and many, many uh, other people in positions of power and influence are all women. It seems to be almost a matriarchal society. What have they done to put in place um, support mechanisms which make it easier for women to succeed in public life? Well, I'm researching some of this for the book I'm writing, but it's, it's quite extraordinary. And I, I honestly, even in my wildest dreams, I'm not sure I see the United States going all the way to what Sweden uh, has. I mean, one thing they have is you get a year uh, maternity and paternity leave. You can't take maternity leave unless your husband takes paternity leave. So if you want anybody to be home with the child, you both have to be home with the child sequentially, which is enormous, right? It, it automatically levels the playing field right. uh, in, in a required way. And then there are also, of course, there's terrific daycare. There's on-site daycare. There's all sorts of paid leave in various ways. But what, what's happened is it really has changed the norms. I was recently talking to a very high-level uh, Swedish diplomat who said that his son's generation just has a completely different set of expectations yeah. about what kinds of fathers they want to be. It isn't imposed, that, but they want to be. Uh, and that's really what you have to do. You have to change the norms so that somebody who says, I'm taking a year out for, for a young child, or I'm working, I'm gonna defer a promotion because my child is a certain age and I don't wanna travel, is seen as a valued, balanced, healthy, productive worker, not somebody who is not committed to their profession. I should say, though, the, the statistics in Scandinavia in the private sector are different. worse than ours. So they have not cracked the nut of being of real, full representation across both sectors. They've done it publicly, but we're actually ahead of them privately. Now, when it comes to the great theme of this conference, the un un underlying theme, which is human potential, one issue of human potential that isn't talked about enough is the impact on children of having two parent families, two working parent families, everybody working, children being shortchanged by the demands of dual careers. And you see some pretty frightening statistics about um, babies being, not seeing their mothers or their father in particular, but also their fathers, uh, as much as one would hope that they, they would. Are you seeing that, that, that perhaps there's a, there's a cost to human potential with our obsession with careers and work? Well, I, again, I haven't seen statistics. I, I, I do see what, what I see in, in, you know, at a time we have a tremendous education crisis in this country and we're doing all sorts of things to try to improve our education. And then I look at my sons who are upper middle class privileged children and the amount of time they need for us, from us on their homework, uh, in writing, math, an enormous amount of time. And I think, how on earth can we actually expect to, to improve the standards of our children if we're just focusing on, on the school dimension. And it isn't just the hardest cases, it's across the board. You have to be able to have parents who are home, who are you know, instructing in terms of not only subjects, but you know, the moral issues that come up. A kid cheated today, you know, those kinds of discussions. So I do think there's no way for us to address some of the larger social issues without addressing the work family balance issues. And I think we, you know, being with our children is an investment in the next generation. I was talking to a number of women 
who had decided to, to step out and, and focus primarily on their children. And I said, you know, you should call yourself the national security mothers, right? I mean, in terms of really investing in the next generation, we don't think about it that way. But I would put it that way. I still think, though, we are losing a huge amount of human potential by not allowing the countless women who have had to step out and not been allowed to return to the career that they were educated for and that they started in, that's an enormous loss of potential as well. So there's a huge loss of women's potential and kids' potential. Particularly as careers are getting so much longer. I mean, Absolutely. life expectancies are longer, Absolutely. careers are longer, so why, why are you off ramps and not able to get into uh, a senior position if, if you're going to be around at work till you're 70 or something I, like that. I, mean, <laughs> I, I do think a large part yeah. of fixing this is yeah. changing our time horizons. Yeah. Because if you really think you're working to 70 or 75, then you think you can have kids early, you can have kids exactly. late, but you will still have a 20-year spread exactly. where you can, you can travel. I mean, I keep thinking about the empty nest. The empty nest, sort of, you think of mothers and fathers kind of you know, looking for their fledglings. I think of it as, oh my God, how much time I'm gonna have. <laughs> the ability, you know, if you free up all that time that you're now spending with your children, you've got a huge amount of time. I wanted to ask you about the second part of our title, which is the State Department. One of the things that you took very seriously at the State Department was networks uh, for global governance, ways of linking the ways of linking the State Department or any any foreign policy actor to private, public, voluntary networks Absolutely. and using those as a tool of, of foreign policy. Can you tell us something about that and relate it a little bit to this rather bizarre crisis we're having at the moment with the this film and the the the, the, the Mohammed, um rage or whatever it is, so some some way in which the, 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 these networks can be used perhaps to yeah, calm absolutely. things down a bit. So one of the things Secretary Clinton talks about, and, and she's here in New York this week, and, and President Clinton is running the Clinton Global Initiative, uh, she always talks about the three-legged stool, that a healthy society you know, has a government, private sector, civil sector, and you, you have to have all three. Mm -hmm. And a great part of her view of how we address foreign policy problems is trisectoral, that you have to bring civil society, government, and corporations together, as well as universities and church groups and foundations, the full spectrum of civil society. So if you look at the Obama national security strategy, it mentions public-private partnerships 30 times. And there's a lot of national security strategies that is completely the same from, from administration to administration and decade to decade. But this really is a different view of how we approach global problems. So to give you a, a very concrete example, I was talking to a former high diplomat last week who said, you know, in Egypt right now, thank goodness we created this thing called Partners for a New Beginning, which is corporations, uh, the Aspen Institute, the State Department, heads of universities. Uh, it is designed to foster entrepreneurship, science, and technology in five Muslim-majority countries, including Egypt. Right now, it's sort of the central game in town in terms of where we're blocked in many typical diplomatic ways. Obviously, right. our old sure. relationships have changed. We are forging new relationships with the government, but we have the ability through our universities, through our NGOs, and through our private sector to reach out to lots of very talented young Egyptians who are tech savvy and want to actually uh, create their own business. So it introduces an element of continuity in a world where you're seeing rapid political Absolutely. change. Absolutely. You draw on society, you draw on corporations, you draw on government, depending how you need to. Um, I'd love to get a question from somebody, or two. Hi, my name is Becca, and I'm an undergrad student at Penn. Huh? I was wondering if you had any suggestions as to where I and other young women should look for accessible, successful women who are willing to be mentors for us. <laughs> it's funny you, you ask, well, I think you should march to your wonderful president who knows a great deal about these things, Amy Gutman, and tell her that Princeton has just launched a program whereby senior faculty women are mentoring <laughs> pods of younger uh, students. I just took on five uh, myself. A bunch of us have been asked to do this, and we are doing it really retail, individual faculty, individual, uh, uh, individual women students. So I think you should say absolutely. She will love me for saying that. 
I've got time for one more sir there, one more question, a quick question. My question is to both of you is, is the entire problem of gender equality related to the way we measure success in our societies? I mean, you, you referred to that many successful people could not talk about their unfulfilled lives. So is it accumulation of money becoming rich? That's the way we are measuring success. So how do we drive balance into the whole process? I think that there is a, uh, that's a very important point. And I think one of the reasons this article created such an enormous reaction was not just people thinking about work and family, but as somebody put it to me later, I don't know anybody who doesn't wish that their life was more sane. And that the valuation, the, the sense of value is that it's entirely from your work and your work is linked to how much money you can make. I think you're seeing a rejection against that in many ways. Younger people saying, I want meaning more than money. I want jobs that matter, social entrepreneurship. People going to business school and deciding to use those skills to make the world better, but using private sector principles. So I do think that, that we've, the pendulum has swung much too far. That's part of what I mean by changing the value system, where you really have to be able to say, you know, I admire that person because they have more in their life than work, because they are a good parent, or they are putting things into their community, or they are taking time for themselves, and they believe in a healthy mind and a healthy body. The whole spectrum of, of what we are and what we can give and how we can grow, I think has gotten very badly skewed. And it, as we address that, the work and family part uh, will, will, I think, be an essential ingredient. Yeah, I would just echo Clay Christensen's points uh, in his book that you have with a lot of very successful people, people who are brought up to be successful, who have metrics of success, which they follow all their lives. They're very, very good at measuring how successful they are in their professional lives. And they're autistic when it comes to their private lives. They have no metrics, no sense of what it would be to be successful. Uh, so they just leave that because it's not measured, it's not valued. Um, and they need to have some way of evaluating themselves and their conduct um, in, in, in their private lives as well as their public lives. The second thing I would say is that um, in a world in which we have very, very long life expectancies and li long lifespans, and we're going to go through many stages and many different careers, uh, perhaps as a professional person, perhaps as a, a voluntary worker, perhaps as a, as, a, as a mentor, we need lots of different definitions of success at different stages of our lives and to apply to different, different, different areas of our lives. So we need a richer, much richer definition of what success means. Thank you very much indeed, Thank you very much. Anne Marie. That was wonderful. Great. Thank you.